Hi, I'm Tina Swithin, author of Divorcing a Narcissist and founder of One Mom's Battle. And today I wanted to talk about um, mediation. Here in California, uh, mediation is not an option. It's actually mandatory before each and every court date. So my first mediation session was in 2009, and I went in there wide-eyed like a deer in headlights. Um, I was completely traumatized. I had recently been at the women's shelter and um, the entire process was so scary and so overwhelming to me um, because I had never even stepped foot in a courtroom, let alone, you know, gone into a mediation or, or, you know, I was somebody who really struggled with conflict of any type. So it was really overwhelming to me. And when I walked into the waiting room to fill out paperwork and check in, I just remember seeing my ex-husband and he looked so manic and high. You know, he, he looked completely high on the entire experience and almost like he was preparing for a starring role in a movie. And here I am, <laughs> completely just out of my element, terrified, traumatized, PTSD, and I was so intimidated uh, just at the very first five minutes of being in the waiting room. So you can imagine the anxiety that was setting in, knowing that I was going to be in a room enclosed with him. Um, at that point, I did not know that there are options um, in, in some areas and some states, um, there are options to be in separate rooms um, because I was very new. I didn't, I didn't know the system. I didn't know what my options were. I still remember um, almost 10 years later, the mediator, her name was Tracy, and she came out to get us in the waiting room and she walked us back. And it was, it was a tiny room. Um, he was more manic than I had ever seen him before because he had me right where he wanted me. Um, he was literally feeding off of my terror and discomfort. I couldn't even gather a single thought. I, I felt that distraught and I was frozen. My mind was spinning. It was horrible. I remember that Tracy asked me a question and as I started to answer, Seth cut me off and started speaking over me. Um, I had become very accustomed to that during my marriage, so I shut down, kind of went in, inward. When he stopped talking, I started to answer the question again, and again, he began to talk over me, and he looked irate. Um, I had seen inner rage in his eyes many times during my marriage, but to anyone who didn't know him, it wasn't apparent, but I could see that in his eyes, the look, the look that terrified me at my core. At one point, shortly, about five minutes into it, Tracy stopped our session and basically said, you know, I don't feel this is going to be productive, so I'm going to escort you, Tina, back into the waiting room and I'm going to go ahead and meet with Seth first, and then I'll come back and get you, and we can meet privately. I was so relieved and, and went into the waiting room, and they ended up being in there together for about 45 minutes, which you can imagine where my mind is going, that he has her convinced, um, she's going to believe his side of the story. Um, I was just spinning. I truly wanted to cry. Um, Seth worked in sales and he was literally trained to sell people. Um, I knew that about him. I knew how charming he could be. And my greatest fear was that he was going to sell her on this story um, that he had been the primary parent for my daughters, that I was unstable. Um, it was 
the absolute opposite, but I was so worried that he was going to convince her of this. And it was about 45 minutes later, Tracy came back out and brought me back, sat me down and said, um, I'm going to go ahead and flag your case for a psyche bell. Um, it's not a for sure thing, but it does serve as a red flag to the court that I see a problem. And you're both going to have to take a psyche bell if the court goes that route. Um, but I just don't feel it's going to be productive for us to continue. And I was in shock. You know, I, I realized in that moment that she did get it. And it gave me such hope that everybody in the court system would see through him. And then she took it a step further by telling me that she was going to bring him back into her office. And at that point, she wanted me to leave the building and go home. She did not feel that I was safe leaving at the same time as him. And her validating my concerns, even though she didn't come right out and say it, was huge. Over the years, I've learned a lot from my own mediation experiences, but also, um, I've spent 10 years in the, the trenches of the family court system helping other moms and dads to protect their kids. So I feel like I have a lot of, of knowledge and experience to add to my own database um, when it comes to mediation. And one critical component um, is to find out whether or not your mediation is private or if it's public, or I wouldn't say public, but if your mediation is open, meaning can your mediator make a recommendation to the court? Um, it's absolutely important to find that out in advance. My advice here today really pertains to private mediation. So that kind of falls under the umbrella of what happens in mediation stays in mediation and that is not going to make it into your court file. Um, very, very, very different, um, both types, and, and very important to know in advance. Many people will tell you that mediation with a narcissist or other cluster B individual is a waste of time, energy, money, effort. Um, I personally do not agree as long as it's a private mediation. Um, I think of mediation as an opportunity to desensitize yourself to the court system in general. Um, it's also an opportunity to see the other party's cards um, while being very careful to hold your own very close and not show your cards. Um, you can find out a lot of information during a mediation session if you go in thinking strategically um, and not emotionally. Use it as an opportunity to really see, you know, not only what the other side, what their evidence is, what they're presenting, what they're asking for, but also it gives you an opportunity to see what a neutral third party, um, you know, feels about your case, how strong it is, um, really paying attention to the mediator, um, which way they're leaning, which, you know, what their recommendations are, because the mediators typically know the court system pretty well. So it really gives you an opportunity when the stakes are not high to have a neutral third party um, kind of figure out how they view the case overall from both angles and from both sides. For me, mediation is, is kind of like going to a job interview when I don't really care about the job. Um, I'm just doing it to perfect my interview skills and to, um, to practice. So, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to practice staying calm um, centered, grounded in your truth, and fact-based. So it's it's also, you know, it's an opportunity to think strategically and not emotionally. And when you find yourself getting escalated 
um, you know, have some type of mantra in place. Um, for me, at times, it was reel it back in. You know, you need to to be centered. Um, I would do things in mediation um, to kind of test them out uh, for when I was on the stand. For me, one time it was wearing a, a bracelet. And when I felt myself getting nervous, um, I would take the bracelet off and, and switch hands and just that tactile um, touch of, of something. And it was kind of my reminder that I'm in control and I need to be centered. Like with any avenue of family court, um, there are going to be mediators who are automatically biased uh, to one gender or the other. Um, there's going to be mediators who are just completely inept and clueless. Um, there are going to be private mediators that, you know, there's some level of corruption, whether it be they're friends with one of the attorneys or play golf together. Um, you know, all of those things can come into play in family court in any area. So, you know, when I give advice, it's truly best case scenario that you do have a neutral, um, unbiased mediator. Um, that is my hope. They are out there. I've personally experienced them, and I know there are horror stories, but there are also a lot of positive stories. So, I, my mentality has always been um, I'm going to go in there filled with hope, filled with faith, and until someone tells me otherwise or I've seen it for myself, I'm going to believe that this person truly has my children's best interest at the forefront um, of their mind. And, um, you know, that's my hope, whether it's naive or not, that's my hope for all family court professionals. Until you know otherwise, please, you know, use my mindset on that because power of the mind and it's just so important in these type of situations. Um, and the more you can learn about your mediator in advance or any family court professional, the better equipped you will be, the better prepared you will be. Um, to kind of navigate around any potential bias or, um, you know, how to present properly based on the person that you will be meeting with. It's really important. Um, thank you for joining me today. Um, please make sure you're subscribed to our One Mom's Battle uh, YouTube channel. I will be sharing tips and advice every week on how to navigate high conflict custody battles with cluster B individuals um, because it's my goal to help you stand in your truth while protecting your children. And I know that I have a, a positive success story from family court and I want the same for you. 